If I were crafting what that means, I think it would mean that we're using technology to benefit human beings. Mm. Now, there are a lot of ways that technology gets used that it doesn't benefit human beings, right? And so in order to guide that, you have to have laws, policies, you have to have practices, you have to have a conversation about what those potential harms and issues really are. At the same time, you also focus a lot on the um let's say the artificial intelligence and you know the recent occurrence of chat gpt mm -hmm. and also you know other let's say automatic system that allows students to to ease their work yep. for example uh, grammarly yep. that you know a very famous one you know <laughs> they correct your grammar your sentences yep. um it's good for people to learn i mean on on i mean it gives the opportunity to more people to learn and to do right. better. Right. But at the same time, there's, you know, there's a catch like, don't, don't, I mean, doesn't it make you less, you know, attentive to, to pursue perfection on your own? It definitely can. It definitely yeah, can. Yeah. There's, uh, in fact, the, one of the books I just wrote is on ethical issues related yes, to yes. learning technologies. AI has a load of ethical issues that come mm. along with it. So. The approach we've taken, now some of my colleagues have decided to ban AI. It's not allowed in their classes. If a student is caught using it, they will receive an honor violation mm. or be accused of plagiarism. The problem is that there's not actually any really good AI detection tools. Um, some companies like Turnitin or even ChatGPT themselves, they tried to develop tools to detect when something has been developed by AI, mm, they yes. can't. Oh. Uh, in fact, both of those companies have abandoned developing those tools because they cannot reliably so detect So it's, it's, not, it's not easy just to reverse engineer the exactly. system. No, no, it's not exactly. Like that. So that doesn't, give any, that doesn't give schools or educators tools, mm. right, to be able to tell what a student has done. The approach we have decided to take is that our goal is not simply to teach tools. It's a very simple approach to education. Our job as educators is to help students develop critical thinking and discernment. So what we're focusing on with our students, we've chosen to say, we're gonna teach you not only how to use the tools, but how to think about these tools too. Mm. Because my classroom is not the only universe, right? It's not the only world that exists. Students are gonna go out into jobs and they may make use of these tools on the job, or they may not. They may make uses of these tools that actually put their jobs or careers in jeopardy. So we talk about that. We actually provide students cases and talk about, for example, there were two lawyers in the US who used ChatGPT to write a brief for their court. Mm -hmm. uh, and they submitted this brief to the court the brief cited case law that did not exist because that's what ChatGPT does. It doesn't actually go out and find things and cite it. It's a language prediction model. So it puts together what looks like citations or case law. So the judge is reading through this and notices these references and notices that these don't exist and start asking questions and finds out the lawyers completely fabricated this. Their case was tossed out. They lost their case and they were disbarred. They lost their law licenses. So we share examples like that with students to say, look, if you make poor decisions with this technology, it can have dire consequences for you. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is help you develop a decision-making process. How do you use these tools well? We use productivity tools all the time, right? We use Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You mentioned Grammarly, yes, that's a yes. very common one. We use these tools all the time to support us and help us with things. There are cases of that that are okay. There are times when that's not okay, where we're fabricating or we're not really doing the work. So we also talk about students about what's the difference between productivity, using a tool for productivity, and learning. And when could your use of the tool actually interfere with your learning? And how do you decide when to use a tool to support productivity and when to not use it so you're not interfering with your own learning, when you're not doing that hard work, like you say. Mm. 
I can't control everything a student does. None of us can. But what I do hope is that they develop a decision-making, a critical thinking process. A common sense to right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And a guiding moral or ethical principles for how they use not just AI, but other technology in their lives, too. So I think that's what our responsibility as educators is, to help them develop the decision-making and guiding morals and principles for their decision-making. Yes, Doctor. But just to expand the scope a bit, um, for example, um, these days they talk about, let's say, especially in Singapore, mm -hmm. they talk about a smart nation, you know, including smart society, sorry, uh, digital right. society, digital economy, digital right. uh, government. Um, but I mean, I mean, from your uh, perspective mm -hmm. uh, in, in the you know, digital world, I mean, what, what is that? What, what is a smart nation? But simply oh, put, <laughs> that's a good question. I think every nation yeah. is going to have their own vision for what that means. Oh, okay. If I were crafting what that means, I think it would mean that we're using technology to benefit human beings. Mm. Now, there are a lot of ways that technology gets used that it doesn't benefit human beings, right? And so, in order to guide that, you have to have laws, policies, you have to have practices, you have to have a conversation about what those potential harms and issues really are. And then you've got to develop guardrails. And so I know like the EU is having conversations about that, about what is effective use of that. UNESCO has actually issued guidelines around AI and the use of AI. Ultimately, and this is actually a message I share, this is why I say it's not the technology, it's the design. It's really not the technology that does it. It's we as humans who decide what we're going to do with it. So we're the ones who have to shape what's the society that we're gonna build with that. But most of the time, let's say, regulation is not really as fast as the advancement of technology. Yeah. So normally regulation should be more, I mean, faster <laughs> to, to, catch, to yeah. catch up with what, what's yeah. out there. You know, I read a really good quote recently by a colleague who does work on AI and yes. ethic per ethics related to AI and everything. And she said, there's no excuse for regulation to not keep up with innovation. We really should be developing policies that both imagine possible futures and that, and we should be moving quickly to implement policy now that mm. helps address these issues. The argument that regulation doesn't keep up is an artifact of us taking too long to do things. These are all processes that we probably could actually speed up some. So yes, there's a lag, does there have to be such a lag? I don't think so. I also think if you involve experts in these technologies, in informing uh, policies, like that's what UNESCO did. They went out, they gathered a bunch of experts and said, what do good policies look like on this? Mm. You know, there are documents and resources now that could be informing politicians and decision makers on policy. It's up to them to make good use of that or not. Yes, doctor. But just a, you know, just a, let's say, not a clear vision, but you know, just like an imagination for the future. Let's say, ten years or twenty years from now. Do you, you know, do you like think that okay, uh, you know, the online class will take over the majority no. of the school? <laughs> and you know, no, not not like that. No, 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 no. In no. fact, again, that com that comes back to that idea of the educational ecosystem. Mm, so if you yeah. think of like a biological system and how there's multiple species within that, right? Um, that's what the educational ecosystem is going to look like. There's gonna be these different varieties, different modalities, online, blended, face-to-face, -face, mobile, all in this mix together. For K-12, I very sincerely doubt that anything's gonna be more dominant than face-to-face. -face. You know, mm. I, I don't really like to predict because who knows what's gonna change things. Yes. But most of what I'm seeing is predominantly face-to-face -face with some online learning, maybe some additional blended learning and uh, emerging mobile learning, integrating into that. For higher education, that mix is a little bit more closer to about 50-50. Mm -hmm. So still gonna have mainly face-to-face but there's gonna be more online learning opportunities, more blended learning opportunities and use of mobile for that as well. So, so it's a mix yeah, it's of a things. mix, yes. Yeah, 
and that's the thing is we have to we have to strategically decide which of those options make sense when for different learners depending on the content what our objectives are what the infrastructure is so we really have to be strategic and thoughtful about what options we select so simply speaking young people would prefer more human to human interaction than you know I mean, you, you're not going to expect that, you know, a six years old will wear a VR. That's not no. quite oh. what yeah. I'm saying. I wouldn't yeah. say it that way, okay, actually. Yeah. What I would say is that, in fact, students are expressing more preference yes. for mm. online and blended learning, but they still also want face-to-face. -face. Mm. So what they want is a mix of it. A mix of it, Right? Yes. And we're seeing students do that. Well, they'll take a couple of face-to-face -face classes and a couple of online classes. Because they like the flexibility that online affords them, but then they, there's certain things I also like about face-to-face. -face. So that's more of what we're seeing, is students actually requesting a mix of these learning opportunities. Which one of those is predominant? No, not, not really sure. About right, that, yeah. and, and that depends on the survey and who's being surveyed and, and things like that. So, so basically every, every situation demands its own attention to... to exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, that's a great... Yeah. In fact, it's, it's that's such a great takeaway. I think I would like underline <laughs> it three times and put three exclamation points yeah. there that everything has to be designed for the particular situation and context. Um, you can't take what another entity is doing and plug it in over here because maybe the infrastructure is different. Maybe student demand and interest is different. Uh, maybe there are different needs, you know. So it really has to start with who are we trying to serve? What are our needs? What's our infrastructure for doing that? And then based on all of that, what do we build to, to try to best meet the needs the best mm. way that we possibly can? Yes, Doctor. But just a very last question and sure. um, <laughs> to also the closing question also. Your first time in Cambodia, as yes. I was informed. Yeah. So how, how is the country to you? <laughs> how is it? It's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I have really enjoyed Cambodia. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I've enjoyed getting out and seeing. I've been in Phnom Penh and Siam Reap. Yes. Um, and we've, uh, we've taken the tuk-tuks around mm. and walked in different places. Um, we've enjoyed a lot of great food. Every place that I've been has been gracious to serve wonderful local fruit. Um, uh, sticky rice with jackfruit is probably now my new favorite. <laughs> um, uh, the, the bean cakes as mm. well, those are lovely. Yes, yes, we've had a muk, um, we've had all kinds of dishes. So, no, I, I told the colleague who's helping me around here that um, I'm already planning to bring my family back. Oh, okay. So it's, yeah. it's lovely. People have been so friendly. Yes, I've so. really enjoyed the dialogue with folks. Folks are interested in learning trying to do better, trying to make it, you know, make it what they're doing better. So it's really been a lovely time all around. Yes, Doctor. So thank you for your conversation, Doctor, and about digital education. And it, it's, a, it's, it's a very informative uh, information all along. Yes, thank and you. I hope you have a good stay in Cambodia. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yes, you yes. for your time. So thank you, Doctor.